uh, to the king, Holy Land, Promised Land. And last week we saw that Israel just walked across the Jordan River on dry ground. An amazing miracle uh, that shows God's ability to take care of his people, to provide for them and to lead them in this resettlement uh, of this land. And as they crossed the river, uh, one man from each tribe was tasked to pick up one stone that they would carry to the camp in Gilgal where they were going to camp and they were to set up a monument for the, all generations would remember this amazing miracle that God had done to get his people into the promised land that he was giving them. And so with this miracle, the nation of Israel was in the promised land and would soon begin to resettle this land by driving out the nations of Canaan that are in the land currently. But before they begin this mission, God has some things he would like them to do in order for them to be prepared to obey and to follow and to trust him in this times that awaits them. And as I was studying this and thinking about this text, the events of this preparation time that God gives them have great influence insight for us today uh, as we think about how are we able to accomplish what God has called us to do in our lives. And even beyond that, how can we experience all that God has for us in our lives? And so I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, the Pew Bible, the red book in front of you there is page 154. And uh, we're going to look at this interesting chapter this morning, this time of preparation for the nation of Israel uh, as they were about to go and, and take Jericho in regions and cities and, and, and areas beyond. The first thing we see from the first few verses of Joshua 5 is that in order to experience all that God has for us, we must obey him because we are his people. We see this in Joshua 5, 2 through 9. Here's what it says. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Now, there's a lot of focus on circumcision in this text, which is not a topic we have generally in conversation with folks, but the importance of this is, is that circumcision was a sign that God commanded to be done to identify the Jewish people and their relationship with God. And so circumcision for the Israelites began when God commanded all male, male children born to Abraham and his descendants to be circumcised as a sign of their relationship, this covenant between God and them as his people. We see this in Genesis chapter 17, verse 6 through 11. God speaking to Abraham and he says, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now are living, uh, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
This is this great promise that God made to Abraham, that he would make him uh, an eternal covenant to be in relationship with Abraham and all of his descendants after him. And the covenant promised to make Abraham and, and his descendants fruitful and that nations would come from them, that they would have great impact in the world around them. And the most important aspect of this covenant, this relationship, is that God said to them, I am choosing you, Abraham, and all who come after you, you will be my people, I will be your God, we will live in relationship now and forever, and I want you to be my people. And he says that the land of Canaan, which Abraham had, had moved to and was living in, he says, this is going to be your land. This will be the land that I give my people as their God. And so he would provide for them, he would guide them, and he would be with them in this land. Now, this is the land, of course, that our Israelite friends are resettling in our story of the book of Joshua, this return to the land after their slavery in Egypt that God had promised would be theirs. And the sign of that covenant was that every male from eight years on, uh, eight months, eight days on, would be circumcised. And in the case of our generation we're talking about now, they were adults, they were having this done. And so God's covenant with Israel is the basis of their relationship with God. And that covenant was to give them the land of Canaan. And so it's very appropriate that, that as this group of people, as these people of God are moving into this land to resettle it, they've just crossed the Jordan, they've seen God miraculously bring them into this place, that they stop and they listen to the Lord and he says, listen, you're my people, I chose you, now's the time to be circumcised, it's a sign of your commitment, your relationship with me, and they willingly go about and do that. And so Joshua circumcised the people to show their obedience to God's command and their commitment to know and love and follow him in their life. And after they am circumcised, God tells them that the reproach of Egypt is list, lifted from them now that they trust and obey him. It says, then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Now, the reproach of Egypt, I believe, as I've looked at this, is is we kind of have to put ourselves in the context of what's going on here, right? So you have Israel that God miraculously delivered from Egypt. Remember the plagues, and the Egyptians saw the power of God. Each of those plagues was related to deities that the Egyptians trusted in, and so God basically obliterated their belief system and all the gods they trusted in, and he proclaimed to the most powerful nation in the world that he alone is the Lord of all, and that this is his people that he is caring for and taking care of. And then not only do they leave, and Egypt, Egyptians send them off with goods and resources and money and wealth and even some slaves or people that would go along with them. They get to the edge of the Red Sea and God parts the Red Sea so they can walk across on dry land and be delivered. And then as they're on the other side, Pharaoh's chariots come racing after them and the water crushes the people. And of course, at this point, Egypt's like, man, this God is something special and he must really care for these people. And then as they're observing this from afar, what happens? Well, God takes them to Sinai, gives them the law, really constitutes them as his nation. And they go to the edge of Canaan and they send the spies out. And then all of a sudden for 40 years, they're wandering around in the desert. And you can't imagine that the nations around them and the Egyptians even are going, what happened to their God? What happened to these people? We saw this power, and now they're just kind of lost. Did he abandon them? Did he say, I don't want to be your God anymore? You're not my people? This, I believe, is the reproach of the Egyptians, of the Egypt, is that they, all the people around them would have said, well, I guess their God abandoned them. I guess maybe he wasn't quite as strong as we thought he was. And so what's interesting is the generation that rejected God's plan to give them that promised land, they were circumcised. They followed that in those 400 years of slavery, but they faltered in their faith in the moment when God said, will you trust me to give you the land? And now a new generation has come. That old generation was punished or disciplined because of their lack of faith, and they wandered in the desert, and they died out. But while they were there, whether it was just the fact that they didn't have time to do this or chose not to do this as rebellion, they were not circumcising their sons. And, and so now, as they are about to go, or they've already crossed the Jordan, they're in the promised land, they're going to start resettling. They show God, we love you, we're obedient to you, we'll follow your commands. And so they have uh, the men and the young boys circumcised from that point on. Now, if we talk about this issue of circumcision, that we're no longer required to be circumcised to show our relationship with God. 
Instead, the New Testament tells us that we show our relationship with God through faith in Christ and our identifying with him. Uh, Paul speaks about circumcised decisions place in the lives of the Israelites and how we're no longer required to do that to show our relationship with him in Romans 4. Starting in verse 3, it says, uh, Paul is making an argument here about being saved by grace through faith in Christ and what he has done and his righteousness credited to us. And he's dealing with this issue of circumcision and obedience to the law because a false view became that you have to earn your way to salvation by keeping God's law, which was never how that was intended to work. And so Paul is discussing this, and he says this, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, Paul begins there, and he's saying, listen, Abraham was saved from his sins and was brought into relationship with God, not because he was obedient to God, although that certainly was an important part of his relationship with God, but because he believed God would do what he promised him. He believed that God would make the nation great out of him. He believed God would bless all the nations of the world. He believed that God would take care of his sin, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so Paul goes on in verse 9 then to say, is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision. Look at that, a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Him. He is the father of us all. The main point that Paul is trying to make here is this, is that every, in all generations, we are saved and forgiven our sins and brought into relationship with God because of our faith in who God is and what he has done for us, not through the works that we do ourselves. He says very clearly, circumcision was a sign of the relationship. And he even goes so far to say, and this is true in the Old Testament, we see this in several places where God says, I, I want your hearts to be committed and devoted to me and love me and worship me. And not just the outward signs. The outward signs done with a heart that's committed to the Lord have great benefit. But the outward signs alone without a heart have no benefit spiritually. And God will not honor that. In fact, later on, we see before they were taken into captivity by Babylon and Assyria and those, is that they were pretty faithful to do the sacrifices and keep the law and they had all kinds of stuff, but they didn't love God. They worshiped other gods as well. They, they weren't worshipers of God alone and God brought discipline and punishment into their lives. What God wants for us now, what God always wanted, is that we trust in who God is, that we believe in what he has done for us, that we rely upon what he has done. And the promise given to Abraham. And it's interesting here, Paul mentions this reality. He says that Abraham is the father of us all. How can he say that? Because that was the original promise, that not only would he draw the people of Israel and make them a nation and reveal himself to us in the world through that, but through them, ultimately Jesus the Messiah, all people would have opportunity to know God and live in relationship with him. So Paul wants us to know that both those who are circumcised as a sign of the covenant God made with Abraham and those of us who come to faith in Christ now are saved from our sins because of our faith or trust in God's promise to forgive our sins and make us righteous before God. He says this even more clearly in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. He says, in him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with circumcision done by the hands of men, 
but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And so what is he telling us here? He's saying, listen, in a sense, we are circumcised, but it's a circumcision of death to self, of trusting in God, of relying upon him. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, which water baptism symbolizes that we died with Christ, we're alive with him. That's how we live in relationship with God now, is faith and identification with Christ uh, in our hearts and in how we proclaim to the world that we're followers of Jesus. But it's interesting, you know, just as the Israelites showed their love for God by being circumcised and obeying all that God commanded as they entered the promised land, we are called to continue to show our love and relationship through our obedience to him as well. John makes this clear in 1 John 2, 1 through 6. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. It's such a great text, right? It talks about we're forgiven our sins because of what Christ has done. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's writing this to us to encourage us to love and obey and follow Christ. And he assures us that when we fail, that we are forgiven when we come to Christ and, and know we're forgiven and confess our sins ongoing. But he says, ultimately, what's critical for us to grasp is, is that as transformation happens in our lives, as we start to truly understand who Christ is and what he's done for us, our love motivates us to obedience. There are times when it's just duty. God has called me to do this, and I'm going to do my best to obey. But I believe as we mature and as we understand God more and as we love him more, as we see what Christ has done, love starts to become our motivation for obedience, as this text says. Very interestingly, he says, um, we, we know that we come to know him if we obey his commands. He says, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And so we show our gratitude to God by obeying him. We're grateful for his salvation, his provision, and his guidance, and his help. And we say, Lord, I want to obey you. I want to follow you. And the other great truth of this is, is that obedience to Jesus brings freedom from sin. It brings freedom from shame. It brings deeper relationship with God and the ability to set, best serve him in this life. And so the nation of Israel, if we want to make that contrast, well, they were so grateful for God's rescuing them from Egypt, for taking care of them in those 40 years in the desert, and now bringing them into the promised land. One of their first acts across the Jordan into that land was to say, Lord, we want to obey you because we're grateful for who you are. We love you. We're thankful for what you've done for us. And it's the same thing for us today. When we look at what Christ has done, when we see his love, when we see his compassion, when we see his kindness and his guidance and his deliverance, we express our love for him through our obedience. And the good news is, is that we all know we're faulty and we're frail people with many difficulties in obeying God in, their, in everything in our lives. But that's why we continue to trust in Christ and rely upon him for forgiveness. And we need God's help. So we pray and ask him to help us love him so that we will obey. We're weak, but he is strong. And he fills us with the spirit that we might grow and mature. And when we sin, we confess our sin. God accepts our forgiveness. And we can ask him for help and guidance and to obey him into the future. So the first thing we see that the Israelites be do to begin this quest to resettle the land to gain all God has for them is that they remember who they are as God's people and they obey him. And this is true for us today. To experience all that God has for us, we must obey him, remembering who we are as God's people. But there's another way we can show, uh, we can, there's something else we can do to experience all God has for us. And so we come to the next point, that in order to experience all God has for us, we must remember our salvation and God's ongoing provision. We see this in the verses 10 through 12 of Joshua 5. He says this, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. Crossing over the Jordan, 
After they do this, the Israelites remember God's salvation from slavery in Egypt, and they celebrate the Passover. Remember, the whole point of the Passover was to get them out of Egypt, to get them out of slavery, to bring them back to the land of promise. And so how fitting is it that as they cross the Jordan, as they're camped at Gilgal, as they've seen God's provision, they're in this land, they see what God is going to do to give it back to them, the the first thing they do is they celebrate Passover together. They remember God's deliverance. They remember God's salvation from them. And what's really interesting as well is that upon crossing the Jordan, the Israelites no longer need God's miraculous provision of manna because God is going to start to provide for their needs through the produce of the land of promise. It's a direct fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. Listen to this. This is God speaking to Moses. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, right, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's exactly what they're witnessing, is they've come into this land And what before scared them and prevented them from going in because they said the cities are too strong and the people are too entrenched. Now they've seen God bring them into the Jordan. They're in the promised land and they're looking at these cities. They're looking at this produce and they're saying, God provides for us. And he says, I'm going to provide for you from the land. No longer will I need to give you the manna daily. Instead, there's a land now flowing with milk and honey. I've always loved that phrase. Um, when I was in college in Chicago, I would talk to my Midwestern friends about going back to California, and I would say, it's the land flowing with milk and honey, and they thought I was stupid. I was a Bible college student, so we had stupid jokes about Bible stuff all the time. Maybe some other time I'll tell you about me need to make an Abishag comforter. Do you know the story of Abishag? That's a story for another day. Look it up in your Bibles. <laughs> this is why I have notes, because I go off on Abishag. <laughs> But I just love this, this idea of what God does here, right? Here, here they're in the land. They remember their salvation. And God says, I've provided for you through this manna. Now look at what I have for you now. Land flowing with milk and honey. I'm good to you. I'm faithful. I care for you as my people. And the truth is that just as the Israelites remembered God's salvation and experienced God's ongoing provision for their needs, we too can daily remember Christ's salvation and his ongoing provision for our needs. We need to do this, right? Because remembering Christ's grace and love and mercy that saves us, it motivates us to love and obey him more. Remembering Christ's salvation helps us during times of hardship to know that God loves and cares for us because he proves his love by dying for us. He proves his love by these stories in scripture that are there for us to look at and say, this is the same God. He took care of these people for years and years and years. Even in his time of discipline, he took care of them. He promised them generations before what would happen. And even though some of their hearts were stubborn and they didn't trust in God, he still was faithful to his covenant relationship with them to be their God and they were to be his people. And that's the same God that loves you and cares for you and provides for you today. And yeah, hardships are real. And sometimes we don't know where their provision is going to come from. But we can look at these stories and hold on hope and say, Lord, help me. Remembering Christ's ongoing provisions helps us to be happier and more positive in life. A little while ago, I was, I was feeling particularly down and low and anxious about some stuff going on in my life, and I decided that instead of just sitting around my house and moping around, I'd walk around the neighborhood and mope about my life. And so I started walking through the neighborhood and was ruminating and thinking about all the stuff I was struggling with and, and how low I was feeling. And, and the Holy Spirit prompted me, and he says, you know, why don't you think about the things you're grateful for? I said, okay. And so I started first about my own salvation, that I'm saved and I'm forgiven and God's ever-present patience and mercy and grace and love for me and that even as I fail and struggle that his grace is enough and sufficient and he forgives and he keeps working in my life and, and that was encouraging. 
And then as I started to think about other things in my life, right, his, his provision to me of my wife that I love dearly and my kids that I enjoy being with and my home and the house that I have and the ministry I have and in our community and the friends that I have and God's provision financially in the past and how he can take care of us now and my hobbies and all of these things. It was amazing how as I went from dwelling on all the negative stuff I saw in my life to dwelling on all the blessings and the things that God has done, my attitude lifted tremendously and hope was stirred once again in the midst of me and that's the value of remembering God's salvation and ongoing provision for us it's absolutely necessary for our lives to know God's peace and his comfort to find hope and to be able to see and receive his guidance in our life and so the Israelites know this right they they celebrate Passover and they say God has saved us And then they look at the land and they say, God is providing. He gave us manna. And now we've got milk and honey and grapes and everything else that we're going to be able to enjoy. So first we saw that experience all that God has for us, we must recognize who we are as God's people and obey him. Then we saw that we must remember our salvation and God's continued provision for us. And now we see that in order to experience all God has for us, we must depend upon God's holiness and help. Look at Joshua 5, verses 13 to 15. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell down, face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servants? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You know, we don't know exactly the the setup of this. Perhaps Joshua, as they've camped and maybe he's just as going out to scope the land. He's near Jericho, it says. So maybe he's just kind of looking at the city and praying and thinking about what's next. And in this encounter, God comes to Joshua. And I think the reason God comes to Joshua here is that he wants to, to, to assure Joshua that he is with him in the midst of this, that this task they have to resettle, to, to, to conquer and drive out the people is a big task, right? These are established nation states and cities and, 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 and civilizations that have been there for a while, that have military might, that have homes and, and, and resources. But God wants him to know, listen, you're going to be able to do this as you depend upon me because I'm the one who's working this in your life. And so he's near Jericho and he encounters this person that turns out to be a divine being. Now, I I and many scholars, I believe this is a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the, the word of God. There's several reasons for that. First, it seems very, very significant or similar to to uh, Moses' interaction with God in the burning bush, right? There, I think it probably was the Father directly, but here, I think Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has been sent by God to comfort and to assure and to proclaim his holiness to Joshua. This divine being accepts worship from Joshua, which angels never do in the scriptures. And it's interesting, another term used in the Bible for a similar angel is called the angel of Yahweh. And this angel appears to Balaam and to David. In both of those encounters, he's, he's brandishing a sword as well in his hand. And I think the title's interesting too. The t- commander of the army of the Lord suggests that Yahweh is another person from the commander or there's another person involved in here, right? So this fits within this Trinitarian idea of theology where you have persons within the Godhead. So the commander of the army of the Lord, right? He's the second person. He's the one in command of this army, but there's another Lord he's referring to as well. Either way, this person is worshipped as God and is God in some form, uh, some representation of his personhood. And it's interesting, Joshua's curious, he doesn't seem to recognize this person as divine, he's just a guy with a sword, right? And Joshua walks up to him and says, hey, are you for us or against us? The NIV says neither. I think a better translation is maybe just no. I think the point of is is the person that he's talking to, God here says to him, listen, that question's not that important. (laughs) What's important is that you understand who I am. Now, of course, as the commander of the Lord's armies, he's going to help Joshua because God has promised he would give them the land. 
but he wants him to understand that, listen, I have come to accomplish God's will in your life and the nation of Israel and the people that I'm going to displace as well. And so the key point of this encounter is Joshua's submission to this holy person. He knows God is to be worshiped, and so he bows down before him. God tells him to take off his shoes because this encounter is holy. It's a, it's a special moment where it is set apart, where God reveals his presence to Joshua, and Joshua submits to God's direction and his will and trusts that God will deliver them and accomplish the task of taking the land. The same was true for Moses. Remember the burning bush? He, he submitted to God's will. It took some encouraging from, on Moses' part. He was a little reticent to do that. And God said, fine, take Aaron along with you. Here Joshua, though, says, I'll submit to what you're going to do. And it's such an important part. And, and it's important as we see this is before Jericho happens, before Ai, before all these other conquests that the books is going to talk about. There's this moment of stillness and recognition and submission to God and saying, I and the people of God are dependent upon God's work in this world. And it's a wonderful reminder for us today because God serves, calls us to serve him and to share the gospel and to help those who believe to grow in their faith. Right? We have a mission and a purpose to make disciples. And we're going to use lots of different techniques and opportunities to do that. But we must always remember that we are relying upon God's power to change hearts and minds. Jesus tells us this in John 15, 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The Israelites are absolutely dependent, and Joshua is absolutely dependent as, as their leader upon God's working and moving in this situation. And we are absolutely dependent upon Christ moving and working in our lives. Apart from him, we can do nothing. It's a vine, this vine analogy, right? That there's vitality being connected to the vine. We are the branches. It flows through us. We must trust God. So as we think about this week, right, we're about to embark on VBS, this great time of year with lots of excitement and fun and, and busyness and tiredness and all the stuff that goes along with that. But, but when spiritually transforming things happen this week, and I know God is going to do that, it's because of his presence and his work to accomplish change in the lives of these kids and us and the families that are a part of it. And so we should praise God for that. We should also be in prayer that he works and brings about good fruit of salvation and spiritual growth and fellowship with the children and their families and those of us who serve, knowing that God's power can bring change in those kids and in us. But beyond this week, as we talk about how do we share the gospel with family and friends and coworkers and neighbors, right, that, that we recognize that if we're going to continue to share the good news with Burlington and beyond, if we're going to see Kylie be effective in her ministry, it's because she's dependent upon the Lord. It's because we're dependent on the Lord. We're praying and asking God to work in the lives of the people in our lives. And so parents, to pray and talk with your, about your faith with your children and encourage them to know, love, and follow Jesus, right? To pray about how do we share the gospel with our neighbors and coworkers and looking for those opportunities that God brings. I had another one of these yesterday. I'm washing my car. I don't know how come washing my car brings spiritual opportunities, but I'm grateful it does. I'm washing my car in my driveway, and a little neighbor boy comes up. And we're talking, and he's, he's very talkative and very cute. And uh, we're, I'm washing, and, and he sees a rainbow somehow. I don't know if it's in the air or on the ground or whatever. And he says, oh, a rainbow. And I says, oh, do you, know the, do you know about the story of the first rainbow? And he says really intelligently, well, it's like air and molecules <laughs> and water. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true. That is <laughs> what, a, what a rainbow is. But I was thinking of, do you know the story from the Bible of the first rainbow? And he says, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't really go to church. And I said, well, let me tell you, it's the story about Noah and how he, he, he punished the earth because they didn't believe in him and he saved all the animals. He says, oh, I remember the story of Noah. And I said, yeah, after, after Noah got off the ark, God put a big rainbow in the sky to promise that he would never destroy the earth that way again. And he said, oh, that's interesting. You know, he didn't have any profound spiritual change that I'm aware of. But nonetheless, it was an opportunity, right, to talk to a little neighborhood boy and it just came out of a rainbow on the ground or in the air from washing my car, right? I think these opportunities are around us all the time. God is working and he's moving, but it, it comes down to, am I in a place spiritually, am I in a place relationally that I can have those conversations, that I'm seeing them come up? I didn't plan to talk about rainbows that day at all. Certainly not while washing my car. 
But God brought that opportunity in, right, to a little boy that needs love and encouragement. He doesn't know God, and his family's not a church family. And, and so an opportunity there for us to say, look, God's working all around us. Are we praying for that? Are we asking God's power to work? Are we seeing how he's doing that? Are we taking those opportunities and have God's wisdom to respond, to share his truth in our world? And not only do we depend upon Christ to serve him, but we depend upon Christ's holiness and help for our lives as well. Right, if we think about this, he is the one who forgives our sins and makes us right with God through his death, burial, and resurrection. His holiness is given to us that we can be acceptable to God. He is the one who sends the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin and, and our need for him and to help us know God's love and how we can turn to him. He's the one who works through the Holy Spirit to produce his character in our hearts so that we have the spiritual fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and self-control, right? That's a fruit of our relationship with the Spirit. He's the one who guides our steps and gives us the opportunities to help others know, love, and follow Jesus and for us to grow and mature. And so just as Joshua stood before this divine being, I'm going to say the second person of the Trinity before he came to earth is Jesus. And he says, I want you to understand that I'm present and you must depend upon me. And it's the same for you and I. That we depend upon what God is doing in this world, what God is doing in our lives. And there are active steps we can take to depend upon Christ more in our lives. This is not a profound list. It's one we know, but one that we need to keep practicing. We read God's word. Are we meditating on it? Are we studying it? Are we help, asking him to help us understand it and live it out? We can pray and grow in our ability to pray. And what is praying? It's speaking and listening to God. Right, to get to the point where we're expressing our hearts but listening to how is God going to speak back to me about my life? How's he going to encourage me and love me and show me truth and change me? That's really what prayer is, this opportunity to meet with God. As Joshua met with, with, with God as the man with the sword, had a life-changing encounter and assurance that he is with them, we can have those things as we pray and spend time with the Lord as well. We can join with the church to worship and learn and serve and fellowship. God is speaking and moving in our lives here. We can confess and repent of our sins and we can serve others and ask God to give us the compassion we need for those who need to know Jesus. This is the active things we can do to say, Lord, I'm dependent upon you. I need you in my life. I want you in my life. Show me how to grow in my love and trust and obedience and faithfulness to you. So what have we seen today? That in order to experience all God has for us, we need to first recognize who we are as God's people, right? We need obedience to him as his people. Then we need to remember our salvation as God's people and his provision for us, right? Obedience, remembrance, and finally dependence upon Christ and what he's done for us. As we continually do these things, as we continually ask God to help us do these things, I firmly believe what we will see is that God broadens our exposure of him, our love for him, our effectiveness in this world to live for him and grow in our love and help others to know and follow Christ as well. Would you bow with me in prayer? Invite the band up as well. Lord, thank you for this wonderful text that speaks of your love and your grace and your truth, your provision for your people. Lord, thank you for their example of obedience and remembering who you are and the salvation you've done and, and their dependence upon you. And Lord, we acknowledge that we too need to live out these truths in our lives. That Lord, help us to be obedient to you, to fully enjoy you through our obedience and to understand how your way of life is the best way and will bring us the most hope and joy and peace and purpose in this world. And that we are your sons and daughters. What a great gift that is. Lord, help us to always remember our salvation, remember your caring provision for us. And Lord, that we would always be dependent upon you in our life, knowing that it's your power and strength that enables us to follow and obey and live and remember and serve you in this world. And thank you that you're with us to help us accomplish all you've called us to and to give us the best life we can live now and forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.